Hey everybody, let's make a video using the super sale. There you go. By the way, you can go into ferrocell.us if you're interested in buying one or getting the components to make your own. I'm not connected to that site. That site is owned by the inventor and friend of mine, uh, Tim Vanderelli. Uh, it's just actually optically flat glass. There's a ring of LEDs. People said, oh, you're just looking at the lines from the LEDs. Well, a few years ago, I was like, I'll show you. I actually... Uh, use the same uh, glass and same uh, liquid between the glass, and I only had it lit by one thing, and that was the sun. I took it outside and I said, look, got the exact same pattern, there's only one light, and it's the sun. So you're not looking at the lines from all the LEDs. Um, the optically flat glass is just basically super, super flat glass. Uh, two ingredients, mouse milk, which is basically like an antique form of WD-40. It's some nasty chemicals like tooling, naphthalene, and ferrofluid. Yeah, got a little magnet here. There you go. And you see the ferrofluid sticking to the magnet. I'm going to look at constructive and destructive interference, which, of course, is the conjugate geometry of the entire universe. Let me put my glasses over here to the side. Yeah, let me put the camera in, and we'll take a look. And we'll look at a couple different things. Here we go. All right, now let's zoom in a little bit. And first, let's uh, put the magnet on top of the glass. Um, regular glass uh, looks like, uh, you know, a mountain range underneath the microscope. Optically flat glass is just super flat glass. Here we're actually looking at either pole of the magnet. Now, which side is red shifted and which side is blue shifted? One side's more blue than the other. That way you could actually tell which pole is which. This is blue shifted, this is more red shifted, so that means this side is the south pole. Let's place it underneath the, uh, the uh, supercell here, and we can zoom in a little bit more and center it a little bit better. There we go. Yeah. See the black spot in the middle? Everybody says, well, that looks like a black hole. When I turn it on its side here, there we go. And place the supercell on top. Everybody says, well, that looks like the face of an owl. And, of course, over here we got the blue shift. That means that's the south pole. Right here we have the plane of inertia. We always see a, a bright white line, brighter than any other line. I keep moving it around because it'll actually burn in the image. By burn in, I mean actually uh, conglomerate the uh, ferrofluid uh, towards one uh, end or the other. Here you can see. This is not a projection, by the way. This is actually uh, the magnetodielectric field that you're actually seeing on each and every magnet. You can see the red shift over here and the blue shift over here. I got one buggy LED in this. That's why you'll actually see a little bit of a flicker um, on this. But this bright white line right here that's brighter than the rest, well, that's between either quote-unquote pole. The magnet doesn't actually have poles. It is the inverse of counter space. That which, of course, is the creation of space. Torus, of course, is the creation of space. It's the inverse of the dielectric field. The dielectric field is right here. That's the acceleration, increasing inertia and acceleration towards counter space. Right here in the lowest pressure mediation between the magnetic and the dielectric, or the fight, let's say ice and water, which of course are one and the same thing, the fight between ice and water, the rest point would be the lowest point at which there is any disturbance between constructive and destructive interference. That's why there's the brightest white line right here. I see that little flickering LED over there. Let's uh, use a, a ring magnet. Uh, let me grab it over here. It's kind of hard to see in the dark, but now a ring magnet, of course, is shaped exactly like a torus, even though it's a flat torus, it's still the same. A magnet doesn't actually have a magnetic field. It is a point source object that's actually creating constructive destructive interference and an ab extra field relative to the medium. Now, the medium of sound, of course, is um, the air, oxygen and nitrogen. The medium of all fields, of course, is the ether. All fields are ether perturbation modalities. So in the middle here, where we have absolutely nothing, we'll see the exact same thing here in the middle where there is nothing as you do around each and every magnet. Because the field is not being emitted by the magnet. It looks like a spirograph, right? A spirograph is, of course, a hypertrochoid pattern. The reason why I'm moving it around, you can see if I remove it away quite quickly, it starts to pool the uh, nanoparticles of... Uh, uh, the iron in the ferrofluid, but this is real time. Once again, this is not a projection. And these lines that we're seeing, you know, have proven endlessly, including one light source, that being the sun, to show that we're not looking at the LED. Well, you're looking at the lines, you're just looking at the LEDs. And that's not the case at all. It's 100% undeniable. If I actually were to get down here in an angle, you could actually see the torus in the middle here. I'll unmount the phone, my little camera. We'll look at it. 
at a drastic angle. I'm gonna use my little crayon to move it around. You can actually see the donut there if I get it at a steeper angle. You can actually see it ab extra around here and you can see it also too right here in the center is if I start to tilt up, you can actually see the hole here. So we got a hole inside of a hole, that little hole right there where the dielectric is, i.e. the rest point. Everything seeks a rest point. The uh, field geometry of the dielectric is a hyperboloid or an hourglass shape. Of course, the field geometry of the magnetic is a torus. Of course, the wonderful thing about ring magnets is that the magnet is already in the shape of the magnetic field, so it creates interesting geometry. However, it never changes between the torus and the hyperboloid, but when you actually have the magnetic field that's the exact same shape as the physical magnet itself, you get this interesting pattern in the middle, which of course is just another donut or another torus, but it's kind of like a, a donut within a donut. Yeah, let's actually put the camera back up here. Sorry about that for the noise on the microphone. And then we'll zoom in and then we'll place uh, the ring magnet. You see a slight burn in, just a slight burn in where the ferroparticles are actually uh, pooling. Once again, there's nothing projected here. When you take the glass out of here, these are, these are pieces of tape to actually hold the glass together because uh, this is super sensitive and this is a new ferrofluid that I got. And there's just um, freezer tape holding it together at three points on the glass. There's literally just three drops of liquid between the glass, you smash the glass together very gently in a certain way. Most of the liquid squirts out the sides, you wipe off that, and you're just left with like a tenth of a drop of liquid across the entire surface of this 60 millimeter blank of glass. And uh, the actual light is interfering, constructive and destructive interference, the same thing in the dual slit experiment that you actually see. And that's what you do see in the dual slit experiments, constructive and destructive interference. Let's place the ring magnet back up underneath there and Let's place it on top. Let's see if we can zoom in anymore. No, I can't zoom in anymore. Let's place it a little bit over there, closer in. And let's get focused. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. We see a donut here, a physical donut right here. That's the actual ring magnet. And another donut out here. So we actually have a torus, a physical torus with a ring magnet, and another torus in here where there is no physical magnet, and yet the magnetic field is there. So we actually have the torus of the entirety of the magnet, as you see the periphery out here, and we actually have an inner torus right here, and then we have a, a torus in the hole. So we got a black hole inside of a black hole, or a torus inside of another torus inside of another torus, or a donut inside of a donut inside of a donut, right? Let me actually move that around a little bit, take the camera out yet again, and then get down on an angle because everybody kind of likes to see the holographic effect. Yeah. It's just freezer tape right there. You can see that. That's just holding the glass together so the pieces of glass don't slide apart. And that's all that's between there is two drops of uh, mouse milk and a drop and a half, roughly, of uh, ferrofluid. Here we go. Let me get it in a more acute angle. Hey, you're able to see it. Let me show you something else interesting because people think, well, a more powerful magnet has a more powerful magnetic field. And it does, but it's a lot more shallow. So the irony, and that's the, the secret of the conjugate geometry of the entire universe, when you buy a more powerful magnet, and I'm about to put one underneath here, what you get is a smaller magnetic field. And people don't understand that, but the only reason they don't understand that is because they can't wrap their mind around the fact that a more powerful magnet has a smaller spatial magnetic field around it. Now this one is an N60 Gauss magnet. Yeah, if you're able to ramp this up, say, I don't know, a billion times more powerful than it is right now, it vanished from the physical universe. The mass would still be there, but it'd have no magnitude. So this is about the closest earthly equivalent that I can actually show you of a black hole. You'll actually see that the black spot on the center of this N60 Gauss magnet. That other one I was showing you, I think it was an N42 or N50 Gauss magnet, the first magnet, this little cylinder magnet. Yeah, this one is an N60, or yeah, I think it's, it's an N60, not N61, I know it's an N60. If I put it underneath here, you'll actually see a larger black spot in the middle. It's because a magnet is not dominated by magnetism, like the whole world uh, incorrectly thinks, but rather by the dielectric. And there you go. Let me get a little bit of focus there. Here you can actually see it. Huge. There's the physical the periphery of the, the physical magnet itself. But look at this huge black spot, about 40% bigger than on any other magnet. Doesn't matter if it's a sphere magnet or a cylinder magnet, as long as it's like N42, N45, N40 Gauss, Neodymium. Why is it so much larger here? 
Yeah, the magnetism is very small here. Well, this is a more powerful magnet. And that means the magnetic field should be seen way out here. Yeah, but you don't. You actually see this uh, ghost line right here was the limit where magnetism is bending back. It's kind of like, and of course your shower doesn't work that way, but what if your shower was such that if you increase the pressure output from the shower head, that the drain all of a sudden would start to uh, increase its vacuum. Of course, there's no vacuum on a drain. A drain in your shower drains by gravity, of course. Which, by the way, the same thing we call magnetic attraction is the same thing we call gravity is the same thing we call electrostatic cling when your socks stick together outside of a uh, dryer. But, uh, of course, your shower doesn't work that way. But what if you increase the pressure out of your shower heads? And all of a sudden, the shower head water started bending towards the drain. So instead of falling on your head, which is what you would want, it started curving towards the drain. That's kind of the crudest analogy, even though that's not an accurate analogy in real life, because your shower doesn't work that way, that I can actually come up with you to explain that. Because wherever you affect one, you affect the other. The two are like Siamese twins. They're inherently linked. <laughs> I'm inherently linked. Excuse me. <clears throat> at absolutely every level, yeah? Let's show you one more thing. Let me just, uh, keep that down there. Let's show you so-called magnetic attraction, which does not exist, yeah? Now, magnetic attraction should be increasing inertia acceleration. So if we actually have two unlike polarities, which of course magnet doesn't have poles, that's a matter for another discussion I've broached many times, the black hole should get bigger and bigger and bigger if we actually have so-called what people call magnetic repulsion, which is increasing force and acceleration then that black hole should be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, that's exactly what happens. To make this easier, let me put the other magnet underneath the bottom here. There we go, and put it on top. There we go, and now let's see. Which one is this? This is this one is so-called magnetic uh, repulsion. This is like-on-like -like polarity. So like-on-like -like polarity means we have increasing magnetism, and that means this black hole should be getting smaller. And let's see if that happens. And... Can you, whoops, I'm trying to separate out the, so, the, so, the solar cell, the solar cell. Hello, the supercell here. And if I press it in, and I don't know if I could do it at an angle, you could actually see it's getting smaller. You see the black hole there on the magnet underneath there? It's getting smaller. That's so-called magnetic attraction, which doesn't exist. It's dielectric acceleration. That means the reverse should be happening. We have an increasing dielectric. That means this big black spot, or actually this black spot on this one, should be getting larger. Let's see if that happens. Yeah. Let's do it at an angle here to see. Hmm, geez, that's exactly what happens. Woo! As I get it really close without smashing it together, you can actually see the torus over here, the magnetic field shrinking. All of these lines, everywhere you see light is uh, constructive magnetism. Everywhere you see the absence of light is uh, increasing dielectric. Oops. Let's move the magnet over here so we don't smash them together, get the other magnet away. As I, both of these are really powerful pair of magnets, yeah? Watch the uh, the general torus out here shrink because we actually have an increasing inertia acceleration or so-called uh, magnetic attraction, which is not magnetic attraction at all, rather dielectric acceleration. You'll see, you'll see the torus shrinking on both magnets, yeah? The periphery out here, you see it shrinking? There we go, and if I get it really close, as close as I can get while still being able to hold onto the magnet, you can see the torus shrinking. Shrinking, expanding, shrinking, expanding. Get it closer, the torus. But you see the black spot in the center is increasing in size. Yeah, yeah. This is the conjugate geometry behind the, behind the entire universe, from one end of the universe to the next. I hope you like this video. This supercell actually uses really powerful LED lights. That and some new ferrofluid. And this sucker is getting hot because these are some high power LEDs. One of them's got a bug in, and if I tap it just right, one of the LEDs will start to blink, but that doesn't change anything. See the little burn in marks here? Let me put this magnet underneath the bottom there. And that looks like the face of an owl. Once again, which is the North Pole and which is the South Pole? And this one's blue shifted, so that's the South Pole over there. You can actually see that LED up here blinking. I got a buggy LED in it. Yeah. And here we have the, uh, oops. Oh, there we go. The whole thing's buggy. That's actually getting really hot. Thanks so much for watching. If you like these videos, uh, click the link below to contact me or any donation. And the link below is always warmly welcome. Thank you so much.